I'd like to begin, as Tomas did, by expressing my appreciation of the, the invitation to speak in this prestigious place and also to express my regrets that I can say nothing about Tomas Bohr's grandfather that has the fresh appeal of the talk that we have just heard because I, being an historian, have as my principal instrument the written word, which, uh, as we all know only too well, can produce portraits that seem to be caricatures to people who knew the subject at first hand. Now, in partial compensation, the historian usually has a wider net than contemporaries do and catches experiences of other people uh, that might throw light on the person in question. And I will be mentioning other people uh, in Danish uh, culture uh, whom Bohr either knew or read uh, who are not people known in the standard canon of the history of physics. Here is uh, what I propose to do. I'm going to excerpt uh, from the rather long paper that's in the printed booklet uh, in the following way. I'll begin by talking about uh, Bohr's culture, what was in his mind besides physics when he came to discuss the problems that we are familiar with, uh, then his ideas of truth, uh, which are quite interesting uh, and which were stimulated if not given him by his professor of philosophy at the University of Copenhagen. Then I'll talk a little bit about the physics, which will, of the paper of 1913, actually the first installment of the trilogy of 1913, uh, which uh, has traces which I think show some of these, uh, the importance of some of these considerations to begin with on his work. Uh, necessarily, I will repeat some of the things that Thomas Bohr has said, but I think from a rather different point of view, which is not perhaps a bad thing. Uh, so I begin with uh, Bohr's religion, or his thoughts about religion just before the invention of the Bohr atom. As a boy, uh, Bohr was seriously religious. And when confirmed in the Danish state church, he believed firmly in its doctrines. But his inquiring mind could uh, not slumber long in the comfort of traditional belief. And when he began to learn something about life, he began to regard the doctrine of salvation as arbitrary, unjust, and finally meaningless. What could it mean to be saved? Suddenly, with complete conviction, I take this material from the letters he wrote to his fiancée uh, during uh, the years he was abroad in England in 1912, uh, which have been released uh, in part by the Bohr family recently and which provided the substance for the book uh, that I wrote with uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Finn Osred uh, had published recently. Anyway, suddenly with con complete conviction, uh, he realized that uh, he could no longer believe. He went to tell this to his father, whose name was Christian, that his face, faith had snapped. His father's response was a smile. For Christian Bohr, who is professor of physiology at the University of Copenhagen, was an atheist. He had raised Niels in the state church so that Niels would not feel differently from other little boys. But if he had observed the conditions of his marriage uh, agreement, Christian would not have exposed Bohr uh, to grief over the doctrine of salvation, although Niels might very well have felt differently from other boys because the contract for his marriage recalled for the raising of the Bohr children in the faith of their mother, who was Jewish. Ellen Bohr, nay Adler, was the daughter of one of the richest men in Denmark, David Bruch Adler, 
who had returned to Copenhagen from England where he began his business in the middle of the 19th century after the Danish uh, law was changed to remove all civil disabilities from Jews. He was liberal, public spirited, and philanthropic, served in the national legislature, and supported the Jewish community. He and his Anglo-German wife were well assimilated into a country where Viking Jews, that was the name they were known under, that is intelligent cultured Jews of good family, enjoyed full rights and experienced little prejudice. But that situation was not to last. By the time of Niels's confirmation, Jews fleeing persecution in Poland and Russia made up about a third of the Jewish community in Denmark, which incidentally altogether numbered only a few thousand. The Eastern Jews spoke Yiddish, stuck to the old ways, inclined towards socialism and Zionism, and were unwelcome to most Danes, Jewish and Gentile. It was perhaps to shield their children from the possible backlash of this situation that Chris John, who had no faith, and Ellen, who did not go to the synagogue, uh, decided to bring them up as Christians in the state religion. Niels was frequently among Jews in his boyhood. However, his grandmother and his Aunt Hannah and his closest school friends, including his cousin Edgar Rubin, all had tinges, faint or deep, of Jewish culture. Six of the 12 members of this famous students' club, of which uh, Bohr was a member, uh, which called itself the Ecliptica, after the Zodiac, uh, it was organized by Rubin to discuss the uh, teachings of uh, the professor of philosophy, Harold Hüfting. Half of the 12 were Jewish. They included Neil's brother, Harold, and the direct cousin, Liz Rubin Jakobsen, who became an authority on Danish philology and Scandinavian runes, and now ranks with Hannah Adler among the most influential Jewish women in Danish history. <coughs> Bohr's declaration of emancipation to his father did not free him from the vexations of Jewish assimilation and Protestant theology. Just after he moved, to Manchester to work in Rutherford's laboratory in March of 1912, he was forcefully reminded of religious problems. The occasion for this reminder was Easter of 1912. Bohr had returned to Copenhagen from England, uh, not to celebrate Easter, but to try to position himself for a job at the university and also to arrange for his marriage uh, to Margrethe Nurland. Uh, uh, here is, uh, I should have shown this earlier, this is perhaps uh, Christian Bohr in his study, well it is Christian Bohr in his study at the time in which uh, his son told him he couldn't believe in uh, the religion anymore. And here is their famous engagement picture. The arrangements for their wedding in 1912 uh, did not go smoothly because the Nurlands, Margrethe's parents, were pious believers and Niels absolutely refused to be married in church. The distress the episode caused confirmed him in his attitude towards organized religion and for a time he thought to write a book against religion as a public service. He didn't get around to it, but he did write Margrethe's mother to explain why he rejected her cherished convictions. Shortly before he composed this very interesting letter, the Titanic disaster occurred. That made the writing easier for Bohr. In his opinion, nothing could expose the shallowness of religion more effectively than its attempt to square its ideas of divine providence with so pointless a tragedy as the sinking of the Titanic. Now, by coincidence, the talk of the town during Bohr's Easter visit in 1912 was a play by the Jewish writer Henry Nathanson. Its staggering success mystified everyone. Bohr 
or may not have seen it because tickets were virtually unprocurable, but as it ran for 500 nights, he had many opportunities once he had returned to Denmark. What is interesting about this play for our purposes is it is exactly a representation of Bohr's parents' situation, the intermarriage between a Jew and a Christian, a particular uh, pair that reminds one of Bohr's parents. The heroine, uh, Esther Levine, was a Jewish girl from a well-to-do family, and she engaged herself to a Gentile professor. To broaden her horizons, she had gone to listen to his lectures. They fell in love, just as Ellen Adler had done with her tutor, Christian Bohr. Neither fictional family, that is the families in the play, fancied the engagement. Most of the action takes place inside the Levine's comfortable home, whence the title of the play, Within the Walls. This image, uh, which would have made a good stage set uh, for Nathanson's play, uh, is the Adler's apartment. The actors are Boer's grandmother, seated in the back there, and the two little girls are Boer's mother, Ellen, and his Aunt Hannah. The play ends with no assurance that things will work out. But as the Adlers, I mean the Levines, accepted their son-in-law, we may guess that he will come within the walls. Curiously, much the same thing happened to Christian Bohr and later to Margrethe. The Bohr side of the family, which numbered uh, several Protestant uh, theologians, uh, anyway, candidates in theology, uh, did not figure much in Christian Bohr's married life, and Margrethe seldom saw her Christian in-laws, the Oddlers, the Oddlers were at the center of the extended family. One more word about the experience of Viking Jews, and I'm through with them. No matter how well assimilated they were, <clears throat> they were still not quite regarded as Danes. The best known Danish intellectual when Matheson's play began its extraordinary run was his friend Georg Brandes whose brother, incidentally, once served as Minister of Finance in the Danish government. Georg Brandis resented being a Jew. He resented being labeled a Jew and insisted that he was a free-thinking man of the world, but no one ever allowed him to forget his Jewish origins. I take it that much the same thing may have been the case uh, with the Boers. And one more word and the last word about religion. According to Bohr's teacher, Hufting, wrestling with religious doctrine was the beginning of independent thinking. Bohr said the same thing when telling Margrethe about the smile his father flashed at him on hearing his confession of disbelief. That smile, Bohr wrote, my little one, that smile taught me that I too could think. Hufting had wrestled even harder with religion than Bohr for he began at the university as a student of theology, but eventually he rejected the state church for the same reason that Bohr would, that it was not possible to live a moral life following its dictates about salvation. That did not mean, however, that there was no value in religion. On the contrary, the problem for those who rejected it was to preserve what was valuable in it in a secular setting. But how do you identify a value without something like a religion? Niels had an answer. He told Margrethe that he believed that everything true had value and that that belief was his religion. This uh, confession of faith brings me to uh, my next installment. Bohr's confession of faith to uh, Margareta was the product of a trivial disagreement between them. Margareta had sent Niels a copy of Thomas Carlyle's On Heroes and Hero Worship so that he might see himself as she saw him. Also, she liked Carlyle's language. Bohr regarded Carlyle's language as bombast which indeed it is, and that bombast as sermonizing, and sermonizing was a bad word in his vocabulary. 
Margrethe was hurt by Neil's rejection of what she took to be choice literature. So he wrote an explanation that for him there were many truths. The lower sorts found in sermons, the more universally human ones expounded in great literature, and of course the truths of science, and so on, all of which had some value. Then he ends, it is something I feel very strongly about. I can almost call it my religion that I think that everything it is of any value is true. Bohr's notion of multiple truths arranged hierarchically comes straight from Hüfting, whose friend William James once described him as a good pluralist and irrationalist. <coughs> Here he is, he doesn't look too formidable in a professorial setting. What James meant by pluralism was just this notion of multiple truths and the rejection of the possibility of a single all-encompassing truth. As he put it, the whole notion of truth is an abstraction from the fact of truths in the plural. For Hüfting, there was always another truth just around the corner. No question was ever finally closed. He liked to quote a line from Goethe, nie geschlossen, oft gründet, never ended, often rounded, which corresponds perfectly to the phrase that Thomas Bohr chose to encapsulate his grandfather's peculiar method, keeping things open. As for Hüfting, the irrationalist, he, thought, he taught that no single truth can capture a domain because as analysis is pushed forward, it will strike inevitably against an irremediable, inaccessible residuum that does not, will not yield to rational analysis. This was a shocking conclusion for a philosopher to reach, but it pleased Hüfting greatly. As Rubin recalled, Hüfting accepted the irrational element in the world picture with great and profound satisfaction because it regarded as contrary in which everything would stand revealed as the destruction of an essential condition for the value of human life. Of course, it's not hard to prove that human beings can never know everything. In physics, we posit continuity of action as in dynamics because that is our mode of thinking. The great question, according to Hüfting, is whether the idea of the continuity of motion or activity can be carried out in all spheres. If not, room opens for an, inter, an irrational relationship between being and our knowledge. The concept of an atom is a case in point. But we don't have to go looking for examples of discontinuity to prove that we cannot know everything. Our radical inability to know everything is obvious to anyone who attends to the circumstances in which we acquire knowledge. Does that begin to sound like Bohr? But I'm talking about Hüfting. Right? We always suppose, he says, that a clean separation can be made between the subject and the object. This is a delusion. A pure subject is as illusory as a thing in itself. The very act of observation alters the observer. Here again, and I quote once more from Hüfting, we run up against the irrational, and here perhaps we see most clearly how inexhaustible being is in comparison to our knowledge. And here again he found reason for rapture. For it is just in the irrationality and the relation between thought and reality that the possibility of progress lies. Hüfting's guide and inspiration was the person he regarded as the greatest of our thinkers, the greatest Danish thinker. This was Søren Kierkegaard. His views on the subject, object dilemma, Bohr could have known through Hüfting's succinct summary uh, of Kierkegaard's thought. Now, according to the greatest Danish philosopher, it is logically impossible for us to create a complete account of being because our knowledge and experience grow and change, and we are part of the being we are trying to capture. So, we are trying necessarily in vain to grasp something unformed or continually forming. This teaching found its perfect expression for Bohr, in a story by Kierkegaard's patron, 
Paul Müller, a professor of philosophy, considered to be the most representative Danish writer of his day. This story, most of you perhaps have heard it, uh, features a student addicted to thought who drives himself into intellectual impotence by thinking about himself thinking and then by inventing a second self thinking about the first self thinking and so ad infinitum. Bohr thought this story so expressive of the problems of quantum physics and the Danish way of handling them that he later urged it on all his foreign students as soon as they learned enough Danish to be able to understand it. Perhaps it was this line of reasoning I've just been rehearsing about the irrational and the impossibility of defining an object of knowledge unambiguously that Bohr had in mind when he wrote Margrethe's mother that he could prove logically, logically, that there were things about the world that humans cannot know. He was trying to convince her that although he could not share her religion, he still believed in the greater values that religion taught. I believe that there is a meaning in the world, a meaning that human beings cannot understand. And that does not make life poorer for me. On the contrary, it would be so infinitely trivial if I thought that I could understand it. I furthermore understand quite logically that there must be something that a human being does not understand. The echoes of Hifting seem to me to be almost deafening. The centerpiece of Hifting's Crazy of Kierkegaard is the notion of distinctive and even discontinuous stages or types of civilized life. Bohr's blood boiled, as he often said it did when he read great literature or when he wrote letters to Margrethe. His blood boiled over Kierkegaard's presentation of this theme, that is the stages of life, in the book Stages on Life's Way. Here we are on, on unusually solid ground because in 1909, Neil sent his copy of the book to Harold as a birthday present with the following commendation. It is the only thing I have to send. Nevertheless, I don't think I could easily find another better. I think absolutely that it is about the most beautiful thing that I have ever read. He's talking about Kierkegaard, who does not have the reputation in the general public of being a great writer, but in fact, in Danish, uh, he is. Uh, he sent the book to Harold from a parsonage to which he had withdrawn from the bustle of Copenhagen in order to prepare for his master's thesis and examination. Here is that parsonage. It was just the place for a romantic intellectual. I walk here in solitude, he wrote Harold, and think about so many things. He thought about physics, of course, and mathematics and logic, but also about the problem of cognition, the stages of life, the nature of the good. The episode meant something to Bohr, as he could still relate it in accurate detail many years later. Kierkegaard made a powerful impression on me, he wrote, when I wrote my dissertation at a parsonage on Funen, and I read his works day and night. His honesty and willingness to think the problems through to their very limit is what is great, and his language is wonderful, often sublime. Kierkegaard's insight into the human condition was so deep that he had to divide himself into a dozen different personae to do justice to it. These personae appear in his books as characters and on his title pages as pseudonyms. He needed no fewer than six avatars of himself to express the truths in stages. The earliest of the stages, the aesthetic, for which, some for, which for some people lasts a lifetime, is a period of carefree experimentation, a flitting from one experience to another. <clears throat> Kierkegaard depicts it through speeches given by four of his avatars at a symposium on life, love, and the universe. Each of them says something true, though his statement conflicts with what the others have to say. Another avatar in this story a self-satisfied judge sets forth the merits of a good marriage, the essence of the second or ethical stage. The judge's wife 
was patient, understanding, supportive, protective, enabling him to reach the highest level his talents and training permitted. Neither he nor she could achieve as much apart as they did by pooling their complementary characteristics. Each contributed an equal share to the truths of married life. Bohr needed such a partner desperately, much more than most men, and selected a perfect one in Margrethe. As for the third and final stage of life, the religious, it can be reached only by a leap of faith, which as we know was a quantum jump that Bohr made in the opposite direction. Niels interpreted the smile he received from his father when he disclosed that he had lost his face as reassurance that he could think correctly and independently. Like another of Kierkegaard's personae, a character named Johannes Climacus, John the Climber, he was madly in love with thought, or rather with thinking. Having a romantic soul which always looked for difficulties, I'm talking about Johannes, not Niels, Johannes could not persuade himself of the truth of any foundational principle and never advanced even to the threshold of received philosophy. Like Niels before he received the reassuring smile, Johannes feared that thinkers of distinction might smile at him when they heard that he too wanted to think. By the time he met Margrethe, Niels had dedicated himself to the life of the mind and could recommend his creative imagination as the most valuable and only thing I possess, bring to the marriage. This singular disclosure alarmed Margrethe, for could she who had not attended the university be the right companion for an unrelenting intellectual? Her future mother-in-law reassured her. Here is what Bohr's mother said. Wisdom is not the amount of knowledge, but the understanding of and love for the value of intellectual work, which is so rarely valued because so few know what it requires of strength and diligence and unselfish, unselfish striving, but you, Margrethe, and I know it. Well, that did not entirely reassure Niels. He had to satisfy himself directly that his mother had gauged Margrethe's intellectuality correctly. Will you love my work, he writes, even if it does not get anywhere. She replies that she set no limit on her love of his work, whatever it might be. Hufting also put an extravagant value on intellectual life and a low limit on the number of people capable of living it. The highest forms of intellectuality for him were the creators of new theories. And uh, according to his student Rubin, Hufting belonged among the highest class of these intellectuals. His work presents a singular mixture of a strict scientific spirit and a personal, almost an artistic tendency. A characteristic trait in his appreciation of the feelings attendant on the deepest scientific research. So the Ecliptica Club of aspiring scientists could not have had a better mentor than Harold Hufting. I come at last to physics. It was soon after Bohr <coughs> arrived in Cambridge in the fall of 1911 to begin his postdoctoral year in England, he had lunch with the mathematician G.H. Hardy, to whom he had an introduction from, his, from Harold. Niels took the opportunity to lecture Hardy's guests on the nature of truth. His ideas surprised them. For not having read Hufting, they had not heard anything like it before. That was perhaps the high point of Bohr's intellectual life in Cambridge. He was not able to make fruitful contact with J.J. Thompson, whom he had hoped to work with, or Joseph Larmor, or James Jeans, the other mathematical physicists uh, in Cambridge interested in his subjects. They declined to read his sophisticated Danish thesis on the electron theory of metals until it was published in a good English translation, and could not suspect from his awkward conversation 
that he already was their equal as a physicist. Bohr's transfer to Manchester to work with Rutherford in March 1912 therefore offered a new beginning, a new chance to show on the international stage that his supporters uh, at home had correctly estimated his great powers. The chance came with a calculation of uh, the exchange of energy between alpha particles and nuclear atoms that was made by Charles uh, Galton Darwin, who was then Rutherford's theorist, and the idea required the calculation of the frequencies of uh, perturb perturbations around an equilibrium orbit of, in these uh, circular orbits in the nuclear atoms. So the question is, how do the electrons vibrate this way around the plane of the orbit and this way in the plane of the orbit as they go round? Well, Bohr realized that uh, Darwin had made a terrible mistake by not taking into account the uh, time required for the passage of the alpha particle by the atom, uh, which has some sort of resonance uh, with the uh, frequencies of the perturbed motion. Uh, he knew that was wrong, and he knew how to fix it up, and he thought it would be a trivial matter to do it. Uh, so he begins his calculations, and he finds very quickly that most of these modes of oscillation around the equilibrium orbit are unstable, at least within the plane of motion, there are always ones that grow and grow until they tear the atom apart. <clears throat> Bohr thought that was wonderful, uh, the discovery that the uh, nuclear atom uh, was terrible as a uh, atomic model because that meant it contained some truth to him. Uh, he had also worked out the other truths that the model contained of a positive character, namely the idea of atomic number and the idea of isotope, which apparently he saw quite quickly on his own and saw also that the nuclear atom was a perfect representation of the distinction between chemical and physical phenomena, ordinary phenomena that we can influence in the laboratory, and radioactivity, which of course we can't. So having got all these things squared away very quickly after he became interested in the nuclear atom through Darwin, uh, Bohr took it as his particular problem to understand how the nuclear models related to the elements in the periodic system. This was not a problem that Rutherford had thought about or talked about. This was a problem that J.J. Thomson had spent a decade or more on. So what Bohr started to do when he became interested in the Rutherford atom was to try to adapt it to Thompson's problems, or perhaps better the other way around, uh, to find out how to get at least as much out of an atomic model uh, with respect to the building up of the periodic table as Thompson had been able to do. <coughs> In keeping with this program of J.J. Thompson, Bohr considered atoms at first only in their permanent or ground state. Therefore, he did not have to worry about the requirement electrodynamics placed upon them to radiate. This was not a problem that was of any interest to him, actually. Uh, <clears throat> and that's because, by definition, the ground state of an atom was that in which the constituent electrons had lost all the energy by radiation that nature allowed them to dispose of. So they couldn't do anything. The atoms exist. Atoms don't radiate when they're in their ground state. Therefore, it's not a problem. Uh, but this sound definition did not take Bohr very far because it did not fix the dimensions of the ground state. And as Larmor had emphasized in this book, Ether and Matter, which uh, Bohr thought very highly of, ordinary physics cannot determine the size of a nuclear atom. On the contrary, it allows atoms, uh, nuclear atoms of all sizes and in all of them but the ground state they are required to radiate. So to fix the size, Bohr supposed that every atom, that every electron in an atom in its ground state obeyed a rule similar to the bizarre relationship that Planck had introduced between the frequency of radiation and his energy. This is, an, this is a capital point. Bohr did not introduce a condition 
on the orbits, as he's usually said to have done. He, his way in was a condition on the energy, which he translated into symbols that relate to the orbit in the following way. Uh, here's, of course, uh, Planck's uh, opaque rule. Uh, Bohr uh, uh, took uh, this second one, that the kinetic energy of the ground state, which is essentially the negative of the total energy of the ground state, and so the energy you've got to put into the ground state to get the electron up to infinity. Bohr took this as his uh, uh, general uh, concept and then related it to the, uh, the kinetic energy to the orbital frequency. But he's always thinking about how to get rid of that energy to get your stable ground state, which is no longer able to radiate. So he begins with an analogy to Planck's radiation theory, not Planck's theory of oscillators, and he says at the very end of this first paper in the trilogy, after he's gone through all sorts of things that got nothing to do with Planck's theory of radiation, Planck's theory of radiation has been the basis of my analysis. What got Bohr atoms to radiate? Well, he was challenged uh, in uh, the latter part of 1912 by a man named John William Nicholson, uh, who uh, had invented a nuclear atom which could radiate. It could radiate through the perpendicular oscillations, perturbed oscillations, uh, around the plane of stable motion because those oscillations are not all fatal. And he was able to compare those with unidentified lines, the frequencies of unidentified lines in nebular spectra. And he found that he could gain agreement with a simple uh, atom of four or five electrons. He found he could gain, uh, get matches between these perturbed frequencies and 10, I think, or something like that, unattributed lines in the nebular spectra, to one part in 10,000. And then he decided that he would calculate the angular momentum of his electrons, uh, taking a leaf, I think, from the Solvay Congress's uh, deliberations. Uh, and he found that, uh, the, uh, that, they were, that the angular momentum was a small multiple of h over pi, not h over 2 pi, h over pi. Bohr had a problem getting the 2 in, as you will, as you will see. Uh, but, uh, he did get stationary states at this point. He did introduce the notion of excited states other than uh, the, one, the ground state. At which point, he says, all right, Nicholson could be good for radiation. I'm good in the ground state, uh, and uh, we can both be right. This, I think, is a conclusion he reached in Christian charity and as an expert in multiple truths, uh, because, of course, uh, Nicholson's scheme uh, would require uh, radiation spectra that uh, for ring atoms of four or five electrons that should have agreed with uh, magnesium or beryllium or something like that, and of course didn't. Uh, so there could be no real uh, agreement between them. Uh, so when uh, 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 having introduced uh, higher states with a running integer, uh, in order to make whatever agreement he could with Nicholson. In order to do that, uh, having done that, uh, Bohr was in very good shape uh, when he was finally introduced to the Balmer formula. Now, I'm a little bit outside my, uh, ahead of myself, or actually behind myself, uh, before he discovered Nicholson, uh, he went to uh, a country retreat with Margreta in order to work out what became the second and third parts of the trilogy, that is to say, uh, the parts developing Thompson's theory of atomic structure, and here they are out in the winter, in the winter weather. Uh, <clears throat> and here is where I wish to be at the moment, uh, which is to indicate what was so peculiar uh, about uh, Bohr's theory and one which uh, Thomas has already touched on. And that is that in order to get the Balmer formula, 
from his ground state, t proportional to omega, or t sub n proportional to omega sub n after the, inter uh, after the intervention of Nicholson, Bohr had to take the kinetic energy radi of, the, of the grounds of, of the nth state, which is also the amount of energy radiated and falling into the nth state, equal to this thing. And that meant that the frequency of the Balmer line came out to be that. And that, when you say it in words, is completely crazy. That the frequency of the nth Balmer line that you measure in the laboratory should be the frequency of the second orbital, orbital's frequency minus one half n times uh, the frequency of the nth orbit. And that is what caused people to be very uh, perplexed pained and also in some cases exultant. Uh, for example, when Einstein heard that experiments had confirmed Bohr's theory of the hydrogen spectrum, he said that Bohr had made a very great discovery. Why? Because he had freed physicists from a misleading mechanical intuition, just as he, that is Einstein, had done with space and time in the theory of relativity. Now, in order to justify this uh, fundamental rule, Bohr introduced four different and contradictory foundations. <coughs> the first two of these foundations invoked the analogy to Planck's theory with which he had fixed the dimensions of his ground state atom. But now he has got to figure out how to get an n in there and a one half. And this is how he does it. This, how do we know how to relate the radiated frequency to the frequency, the orbital frequency? Well, we don't. So let's just average it. Let's say that at infinity the, uh, into its nth orbit, the electron gives off n quanta, each of frequency omega over 2, or one quanta of energy, of frequency, n omega over two. Well, you can see that uh, there are big problems in both of them. I won't go into it in detail. And you can also see that they uh, contradict one another, and they, one of them contradicts the argument by averages by which he gains the omega over two. So he puts those aside. And he gives you a third one. And he says that if you have an agreement asymptotically between the uh, calculation of the frequency according to quantum jumps and the calculation of the frequency according to ordinary physics, why, there should be asymptotic agreement. This gives him one grounding, but of course it doesn't say anything about what's going on in the middle of the atom. The fourth of his groundings has to do with the quantization of the angular momentum. And this uh, he does in a very interesting way. He says, of course, there can be no possibility of a mechanical understanding of the orbits, but symbolically, symbolically, you can write that the angular momentum is quantized in this way. Uh, and uh, having got the two from this Speech's argument, he gets a different uh, quantification, uh, quantization than uh, 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 Nicholson did. Okay, that's purely symbolic, though, in the original uh, formulation. Uh, now I come to my uh, conclusions. <clears throat> I think you can consider Bohr's four groundings of his quantum atom uh, as so many partial truths. The first two, which rested on the analogy to Planck's oscillators, he had introduced in Manchester to portray the partial truth of, quantum, of Planck's quantum theory of radiation. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. They portray the partial truth of Planck's quantum theory of radiation. The third one, which declared this asymptotic agreement between calculations based on the two theories, uh, portrayed the mutual limitations of the truth regimes of ordinary and quantum physics. The fourth one, the condition on the angular momentum, conveyed the partial truth that the application of ordinary ideas uh, to the micro world uh, uh, was entirely symbolic. Now, I don't think that any psychoanalytic penetration is needed to perceive that a 
student of Hüftings could contemplate with the utmost satisfaction the crisp dichotomy between stationary states in which electrons behaved as if Newton had designed the atom and quantum jumps in which not even a Newton could follow them. Hüfting had no problem assimilating Bohr's theory into his epistemology, for had he not taught that the world consisted of the continuous, describable, and rationally explicable, and the discontinuous, irrational, and novel? And here, in a simple case, in a simple case, his student had found one of those closed doors at which continuity must stop and a jump be made. Or to adapt the words Niels used to reconcile his future mother-in-law to her daughter-in-law's marriage outside the church, a place where we confront the demonstrable truth that there are things human beings cannot understand. What struck Rutherford and Einstein as particularly bold conclusions were for Bohr only what was to be expected. Indeed, what was to be sought. The world is not complete, not harmonious, not rational. Therefore, there is work to be done. Thus the world, according to Hüfting, the true Copenhagener Geist, who, we are told, could instill his message without the receiving person noticing it. The high tolerance for ambiguity that distinguishes Bohr's thought is a trait often developed by people assimilated into one culture who maintain ties to another. As we know, during 1912, the year he took on the contradictions of the nuclear atom, Bohr had several strong reminders, if he required any, of the tensions and ambiguities of assimilation. He spent time with his Jewish relatives in Britain, deliberated over the ethical and social consequences of his refusal to marry in church, witnessed the first success of Nathanson's play about the intermarriage with its echoes of his parents' circumstances, and perhaps he heard or heard tell of Brandis' lectures on the Jewish spirit in Danish culture. Bohr displayed many of the traits reckoned as Jewish by Nathanson and Brandis, boldness, assertiveness, irony, constant striving, addiction to thinking, openness to ideas, closeness to family, humanism, and particularly and oddly, talkativeness. Here Bohr qualified unquestionably. He was forever quoting himself and others, and he developed his papers in discussion with his assistants before he dictated them. He also overqualified in feeling guilt, a commonly alleged Jewish characteristic, which, however, neither Nathanson nor uh, Brandis mentioned. Did the creative tensions of assimilation or its allowance for ambiguity play a decisive part in Bohr's creativity? Did the epistemology derived from Hüfting and Kierkegaard play a part? Did the emphasis on the life of the mind characteristic of high Jewish culture and refined romantic Danish intellectuals like Kierkegaard and Hüfting? Did the unstinting support of his family? I think it would not be safe to rule out any of these possibilities. And with that I could conclude and leave out uh, my final words about creativity which are perhaps not uh, very creative. So, <clears throat> I think I will stop here. <laughs>